But creeds and confessions tear off the mask and expose to public odium those who by the slight of men and cunning craftiness lie in wait to deceive. To such men, creeds and confessions are no less odious than locks and bars to nightly depredators. Such characters, I say, in their opposition to creeds and confessions, act consistently and might be expect and as might be expected. But creeds and confessions are opposed by vast numbers of a very different description, by individuals and communities strongly attached to the doctrines of the gospel, and firmly, resol firmly resolved not to open the doors of the church for the reception of those whom they regard as heretical. Such characters do themselves what they condemn in others. Between them and the advocates of creeds and confessions, the difference is merely circumstantial. Circumstantial, excuse me. Whenever they exclude an erroneous person, they do it on the principle of a creed, as we have already observed. They exclude him, not because he refuses to profess the faith in the scriptures, but because they conceive he has not correct views of the scriptures. Their own views are exhibited to him as a confession of faith, which he is requested to subscribe. If he cannot acquiesce in these views, he is refused admission. For instance, if he refuse to profess his faith in the supreme deity of the Redeemer, his atonement, the depravity of nature, the efficacy of grace, etc., he cannot be admitted. Now all these doctrines, be what they may, are so many articles of their creed. The difference between it and ours, as I have already observed, is merely circumstantial, and the balance appears decidedly in our favor. Theirs is a verbal creed, ours a printed one. Theirs private, ours public. Theirs exhibited by obscure individuals, ours by a learned and venerable assembly of divines. Every candidate for admission with us has an opportunity of examining our creed at his leisure. He may pause, ponder, sift, and compare every article with the word of God. In joining those who have no creed, he has not this privilege. He has not the same advantage for becoming acquainted with the principles of those into whose society he is about to enter. Of course, the union cannot be supposed so complete, nor the communion so comfortable. To the reasoning empl employed in the preceding pages, it may be objected that I have not attempted to prove the necessity or utility of creeds and confessions from the word of God. In reply to this objection, I would observe that if the latitudinarian scheme which I have in the preceding pages endeavored to expose stands condemned by the word of God, it follows, of course, that creeds and confessions by the same divine word are fully recognized and established. Between the latitudinarian scheme and the adoption of creeds and confessions, I have endeavored to prove that there is no medium. It necessarily follows that the condemnation of the one is the recognition and establishment of the other. Should this answer to persons accustomed to close thinking appear not altogether satisfactory, in confirmation of it, I would ask a few questions. Are we not commanded to reject a heretic? Were not the Asiatic churches reprimanded for not excluding erroneous persons? Are we not commanded to speak the same things, to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment, etc.? Now, sir, I presume it will be a task too hard for you, or any man, to show how it is possible to obey these injunctions upon any other principle than that of the adoption of creeds and confessions. If we throw open the door of the church for the reception of persons of the most opposite, jarring, and heretical opinions, it is evident we do so in direct violation of the above-mentioned precepts. On the other hand, if we exclude any, on account of their opinions, we must do it by a creed. Our views of scripture are a creed, and we exclude them because they do not acquiesce in these views. It follows, of course, that if we have any authority in Scripture for the exclusion of heretical persons, we have the same authority for the use of a creed, because it is only by a creed that any person can possibly be excluded. Our creed may be a verbal one, a written one, or a printed one. The difference is not essential. But still, it is only by the medium of a creed that we can possibly obey the above Scripture precepts. I am, sir, a notorious creed monger, but, at the same time, your sincere friend, and very humble servant, John Paul. Letter 3 Reverend and dear sir, having in the preceding letter from principles both of scripture and reason endeavored to prove not only the utility but also the necessity of creeds and confessions, I shall in the present briefly advent, advert excuse me, to a few of the most plausible things you have said in opposition to the cause which I advocate. Page 19, you conclude that, quote, when there are twenty different confessions, nineteen of them must be wrong, unquote. 
With equal force of reasoning, you might infer that when there are 20 pictures, suppose of Bonaparte, 19 of them must be badly executed, and only one of them a true likeness. Nay, farther, if such a mode of reasoning be legitimate, the blasphemous consequence would follow. That only one of the four Gospels contains a true biographical account of our blessed Redeemer. Creeds may be different, but not opposite. Notwithstanding apparent or circumstantial differences, there may be, upon the whole, an astonishing agreement. Page 24, you reason thus, quote, But let us suppose the utmost that your human creed or test, whatever it may be, contains the true sense of Scripture. Yet still it is incomprehensible how it should be any remedy against heresy or any means of detecting the heretic more than the Scriptures themselves. Heretics, you allow, will readily subscribe the Scriptures, though in an unscriptural sense. And what, then, I ask, should hinder them from subscribing human creeds and tests in the same manner? If they will deal treacherously with the word of God, why not much m more so with the words of men? Unquote. This argument being a remarkable one, you very wisely set off by two notes of admiration. With reverence and awe, let us approach it. When you talk of heretics dealing treacherously with the word of God, what do you mean? Do you mean that all heretics are hypocrites? That they do not believe what they profess? That they do not believe their tenets to be founded on the word of God? If this be your meaning, allow me to inform you that a bigoted covenanter is more liberal in his ideas respecting heresy than the reverend Presbyterian. If it is essential to the character of a heretic that he is condemned of his own conscience, he never could be known, and of course could never be rejected. Would a heretic tell the world that he is acting in opposition to the dictates of his conscience? It would be absurd to suppose it. How then could any person ascertain the fact? It would be impossible. The truth is that, however false and erroneous the tenets of heretics, we have no reason to imagine that they do not believe them. On the contrary, we are assured by the highest authority that because men receive not the love of the truth, for this cause God gives them over to strong delusions to believe lies. Their tenets are lies, but they actually believe them. They believe them to be founded on the word of God, and therefore they can profess their faith in the scriptures without any violation of the dictates of the conscience. With regard to a human creed, the case may be different. We shall illustrate by an example. Such a person, excuse me, suppose a person, such as Hymenaeus, Philetus, or one of the Corinthian heretics, applies to you for admission. You ask him what he believes concerning the resurrection. He replies that he believes that the scriptures teach on that subject. Uh, he, that he believes what the scriptures teach on that subject. You inquire still farther, do you believe that the dead bodies of men, both of the righteous and the wicked, shall at the last day be raised from their graves and united to their souls, never more to be separated? He answers, I believe no such thing. I believe that the resurrection mentioned in scripture is to be understood in a spiritual or mystical sense. All that is intended by it is only a resurrection from sin, etc. This, I believe, is what the scripture teaches. The scriptural account I am willing to subscribe, but I will not subscribe your creed. Thus, my dear sir, it appears to me quite easy to conceive how a human creed might shut the door of the church against a heretic, while the scriptures themselves would be no obstruction. Indeed, I acknowledge that when the tide of self-interest sets strongly in, creeds, confessions, scripture, and conscience frequently prove but feeble barriers. The exclusion of such characters will always be found difficult in proportion to the temptations of wealth and aggrandizement. No wonder, therefore, if the English establishment answered the Lyconian description of Pitt, quote, a Calvinistic creed, a popish liturgy, and an Arminian clergy, unquote. In a word, it is not creeds, but royal emoluments that make men deal treacherously with the words both of God and man. Page 18. Covenanter asks, quote, Do you not honestly think that it is necessary for men to be on their guard with respect to the solemn subject of religion? Unquote. To this you reply, quote, Most assuredly I do. And as these subjects will not run out of the Bible more than the stars out of the heavens, we should imitate the example of navigators who never steer by a blaze and always endeavor to make advances in science by viewing the heavenly bodies as they are arranged by God and not as they are fancied to be by that of man. All aid is fair, but whatever the systems be, they will best appear in the volume of nature which cannot be touched, in the volume of revelation which ought not to be assorted. Each object will appear best in its own situation, and the moment you remove it to any other, it becomes deformed and leaves a breach behind. 
Take, for example, a particular verse out of one of the Gospels. And who can tell its meaning by itself, or discover the sense of the whole once it is removed? Unquote. But why, my dear sir, did you dismiss this paragraph without the usual insignia? If the former one was judged worthy of two notes of admiration, surely this was fully entitled to at least half a dozen. In the commencement of it, you talk of subjects running out of the Bible and stars running out of the heavens, a very remarkable race indeed. The Olympic course never exhibited one so interesting. You then inform us that we should imitate the examples of navigators who never steer by a blaze. If this be so, then down with all lighthouses. You next assure us that navigators always endeavor to make advances in science by viewing the heavenly bodies as they are arranged by God, and not as they are fancied to be by this man or that. Pray, sir, is there a single navigator on the face of the earth who is in no way indebted to human systems? When once you have convinced the world of the impropriety of studying navigation by the help of books and systems, when once you have persuaded navigators to throw away these helps and to study the art merely of consulting the volume of nature, then let creeds and confessions be forever exploded, and let the Bible and the volume of nature be the only two books in the universe. But, oh, says Reverend Presbyterian, all aid is fair. A very candid confession indeed. It is all I ask. Indeed, it is much more than I could have possibly expected. All aid is fair. Then doubtless the aid of creeds and confessions is fair. If all aid is fair in studying the volume of nature, why not in studying the volume of revelation? My dear sir, had you duly considered the import of these four monosyllables, quote, all aid is fair, unquote, you would have thrown down your arms, and the battle of dialogues had easily never been fought. But the Reverend Presbyterian is not so easily driven off the field. As if my friend had made no concession, with undaunted courage, he proceeds to obscure, excuse me, proceeds to observe, quote, Whatever the system be, they will best appear in the volume of nature which cannot be touched, and the volume of revelation which ought not to be assorted, unquote. But in the name of common sense, what does my friend mean by the volume of nature which cannot be touched, of this new volume? I solemnly declare that down to the present volume I have never heard one single syllable. It is only with the old volume of nature which can be touched that I am acquainted. This old volume, sir, according to my dull apprehension, we all touch. We cannot avoid touching, for we are living in constant contact with it. Nay, more of this old tangible volume, both with the Reverend Presbyterian and his humble servant, are constitute parts. Philosophically, remarking that the volume of nature cannot be touched, and theologically observing that the volume of revelation ought not to be assorted, you assure us that whatever the systems be, they will best appear in these two volumes. Here again, I must confess my ignorance. I must candidly acknowledge that I never before knew that any system but the true ones would appear best either in the volume of nature or revelation. According to you, it is no matter what these systems are, whether they be true or false, you assure us that whatever they be, they will best appear in these two volumes. Pray, sir, do you really think, and are you perfectly sure, that not only the Copper, Copernican or Newtonian system, but that the old exploded systems of Ptolemy and Descartes will appear in the volume of nature? Do you really believe that the Socinian, Arian, Arminian, Calvinistic, Antinomian systems, nay, that all the systems of divinity that ever were written will best appear in the volume of revelation? If you believe all this, and you have boldly asserted it, you are much more credulous than any of the advocates of creeds and confessions. They really believe that various systems exhibited both by philosophers and divines are so far from appearing best in the volumes of nature and revelation that they do not appear in those volumes at all. Nay, farther, they verily believe that many of those systems have no existence in nature, but only in the bewildered imaginations of their blinded votaries. With great sagacity you go on to observe that, quote, each object will appear best in its own situation, and the moment you remove it to any other it becomes deformed and leaves a branch behind." Unquote. That each of the stars, planets, etc. appears best in the situation assigned to it by the Almighty I readily admit. But how it would appear when removed from the situation I am not at present prepared to say. <laughs>